So I know the video doesn't have sound, but it'll keep the projectors from going to sleep until we get to our video. <laughs> so it can keep playing, and y'all can just guess at what we're singing. That's Gold City. There's several songs of Gold City, so. We'll lip read. Yeah, you can lip read. That'll work. I uh, hope y'all doing well today. It is a beautiful day. It's like summertime again. Um, did everybody get the mass announcement today? You get the mass announcement? Okay. Um, the papers are finished, and they are back there. The policies and procedures, constitution, bylaws. The deacons have uh, agreed to recommend those. As, but uh, as I said today in the mass announcement, we won't vote tonight it's to give people time to look at and read through everything, know what's there, the final, the final cut, the final editing. Um, and like I said, they're back there. So uh, we want everybody to be able to read through and just to know what you're voting on when you vote, okay? They're done at this point, no more editing, they're finished. But um, I appreciate your input in the last several weeks. It helped to um, uh, make it more clear. It helped to bring things together. Um, there were things included there that, uh, well, several things that came from y'all, came from Deacon's meeting, um, some things I hadn't thought about. So um, I appreciate the input, appreciate your patience in the last four weeks. So anyway, um, before you leave tonight, make sure you grab the papers back there. There will be more printed Sunday. Sandy printed enough for tonight. Uh, and if we run low, uh, she's going to print more for Sunday. But... Make sure you take them with you, read through them so you'll know what you're voting on. Um, the deacons haven't decided yet exactly what day. Um, they don't have a problem with it being on a Sunday. If we need to be on a Sunday, it would be after the service, of course, and we would announce it. It still has to be in writing a week before. So um, when we figure that out, you'll have the announcement and it'll be in writing a week before. But uh, please take those home and pray over them and read over them. And I appreciate all Sandy's been doing, typing her fingers off to uh, get everything ready and, and good to go. Um, also, in the mass announcement, I did mention to you that Sunday we would be giving a love offering, uh, taking a love offering uh, up for Donald and Linda Tyler. They have not asked for help. We've helped them some through a benevolence, but... Um, They've incurred quite uh, financial costs going back and forth to MUSC. Uh, there's a lot going on there medically. And um, anyway, so uh, that's something that several church members mentioned. Talking to the deacons feels like something, or they feel like something we need to do. So that'll be Sunday. We'll be taking a love offering uh, aside from our regular offering. So I wanted you to be aware of that so you can be prepared for that before you got here. Also, um, on our prayer list tonight, let's add Paula Thibodeau. Put Paula on your prayer list. Okay. Um, and uh, I remember, continue to remember Donald and Linda. And family. And um, remember Jean and Pat more. Um, Timothy's great grandfather passed away this morning. Uh, my son in law, Timothy. Can't think of his name right now, but. Um, I'll think of it in a minute, but uh, appreciate if you pray for Timothy and his family, okay? What else? Who else we need to add to our prayer list? Jenny Pennington, my friend. She passed away. Jenny Pennington? I remember her and her family. Okay. Jenny Pennington family. Thank you, Miss Grace. Jenny Pennington family. My cousin, Kenneth Cummings. 
he has Parkinson's and he's been falling and they told him he couldn't stay by himself any longer, so they put him in a facility. Okay, Kenneth Cummings. He's in Virginia. Okay. Thank you. What else? Um, Danny, Danny Post. Yes, sir. Been back for too long. Day eight place down there. So. Okay. Danny Poston. All right. Donna Mulligan. Donna Mulligan. Mike Mulligan's wife is visiting here in the Cavalry Surprise in North Carolina. Okay. What else? You continue to pray for me if you don't mind. I'm still working on two research papers and they're all due by Sunday night. So I appreciate your prayers. Keep Danny Hill in your prayer, please. Yeah, for several places on the body. Danny Hill? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, James. That hurricane that's going to hit Louisiana again. Yes. Uh, Hurricane victims to be, I guess. Okay. Of course, our country, everything going on with the vote. And um, as we were talking just a moment ago, our voter guides, uh, they told Sandy that they usually don't send them out until they have them to you three weeks ahead of time. So we'll get them three weeks before election day. I mean, that time. But for those that are voting early, you, you don't get the advantage of using that. But but anyway, just so you'll know, they're still coming. It's just their timeline is a, a little shorter than we, we anticipated. What else? Okay, um, hey, uh, remember Crystal, David and Crystal McVeigh? She's still uh, uh, looking for a job and um, I talk to David fairly often and he's usually watching and um, uh, we've prayed for Crystal several times but uh, she's been on the prayer list for a while and I'll put her back on there because uh, she's still trying to secure a job and oh, also there's a couple of Mila um, and Antonio could not think of his name Antonio and Mila Gomez they have um, have nowhere to stay right now and we help them with a hotel room and um, Brandon and I talked at the shepherd's table and they were meeting with him today and they have a five-year-old daughter. They're living in their truck right at the moment. So, um, but anyway, pray for them. And also uh, Pastor Nestor has been helping with that too. So what else? Ellen, Ellen Roberts. Ellen Roberts. Okay. Others? <laughs> well, right now, if you would just add a Chris. I can't think of his last name at the moment, but if you'll put Chris on there. The Lord's opened the door. Um, Long story short, the, the Bless Every Home app that we've been talking about where you pray for your neighbors. I spoke to uh, one of my neighbors just in passing conversation about the app and let them know that I prayed for them that day. And there's a fellow named Chris that lives with one of my neighbors and uh, 
called me just out of the blue yesterday. He needed some help. He needed some ride, a ride home. And um, he's been getting de a devotion sent to him, kind of like what Sandy's doing with Sunday school via text. And we got to talk a little bit. And we texted a little bit today about the devotion and the scripture. And it's, uh, I mean, it, it just come out of nowhere. And his <coughs> girlfriend is, and her children are a family of uh, a neighbor that's been here several times. As a matter of fact, she and her uh, sons have been here and daughter have been here a couple of times, but it just came out of nowhere and it started from that praying for your neighbors. So just thought I'd share that with you. His name is Chris. What else? We talked a little bit one time about maybe praying for a sick and laying on hands or something and we'll go back and show Yeah. Sure. Yes, Sharon, Sharon and Mike Muir, um, and we already have Gene and Pat. Um, you probably called her out a little bit late, but I, I didn't know how Debbie Jason was. She's home. I knew she was headed home. Jason called me last week about um, asking some questions about a ramp, and he said he thought she was going to get to come home. When did she come home, Miss Helen? Well, that's great. That's great. Um, and that's that's a miraculous story. So good. Donald Tyler never got strong enough to take a hit. And didn't he have one more surgery to take? And if he got to get, they would have to sit that out. No, no. Um, they're still hoping that he'll be able to get that surgery. Um, he still he still has to build up some more strength, and the infection's still there. He still needs to get rid of some of that infection before they can do the surgery. So. It's definitely a praise for Debbie and Jason. Okay. Sunday school and our Bible study groups. Okay. And continue to remember Johnny, Trisha's daughter. Jack, what is Johnny's last name? I'm not sure I believe it's Miles, but I'm not sure. I wrote it down Sunday and I can't remember right now, but We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. It's just Johnny right there. Okay. You're getting old, Steve. I know I am. I'm, <laughs> I'm burning out. Your mind's gone. My mind's gone. <clears throat> okay. That's for sure. All right. Anything else? <clears throat> unspoken. Unspoken. Y'all have any unspoken requests? You want to join Judy in that? Okay. H I L E R. Hallelujah. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Okay. Okay. We'll come back to this in just a little bit. And for those of you that just came in and wondering why we're watching a video with no sound, I'm trying to keep projectors from going to sleep on me. So you're watching Gold City. I hope it stays on Gold City. So that's what we're doing there. I want to read something to you that has something to do with our, our scripture tonight. And um, uh, I just saw this. A uh, couple of deacons are here tonight. Uh, make sure you get this. I've mentioned that. And... Um, text, a group text. These are the um, your highlighted versions of the papers, so make sure you get those tonight. 
Um, this is today's uh, devotion from Billy Graham, and it has everything to do with our passage in James 3 tonight. It says of Eric Liddell, the missionary and great runner whose story is told in the film Chariots of Fire, someone has said he was ridiculously humble in victory, utterly generous in defeat. That's a good definition of what it means to be meek. Meekness involves being yielded. Those who submit to the will of God do not fight back at life. They learn the secret of yielding, of relinquishing and abandoning their own lives and wills to Christ. And then he gives back to them a life that is far richer and fuller than anything they could ever have imagined. The phrase fighting back um, uh, at this life is something that we hear and deal with on maybe a daily basis. We struggle so hard to have the life that we want or that we think we deserve instead of just yielding to God and let him give us the life that he wants us to have, which as the writer says, is far better than the life we could have of our own. Meekness. When's the last time you heard that statement, meekness or that word being used? It's not a quality that we talk about a lot. Meekness is equated with weakness in our society. But it's just the opposite. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is, is strength under control. It's, it's an acknowledgement of who we are. God is in control. And we submit to his authority. Meekness. Bless you. And it's actually talked about in our passage tonight in James. I want you to look at James chapter 3. James chapter 3 verses 13 through 18. We're talking about godly wisdom. Um, I want to read the passage to you, and then we'll let Francis Chan talk a little bit. Verse 13, it says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, and the gentleness of wisdom. And that's, that's the word for meekness, gentleness. His gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural. And the, nat the word natural there uh, can be translated unspiritual. It's the opposite of spiritual. Demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, we pray tonight that you will give us understanding in your word and motivate us, Lord, to follow what it says. Lord, I pray that we would come to understand meekness and godly wisdom and what it means to be yielded and submitted to you. And I pray, Father, that you would have ownership of our lives. We would not think that we are co-owners, but that we relinquish any authority and ownership of our own lives to you. Father, thank you for loving us the way you do and for filling us with your spirit and giving us your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I want to back up in just a couple words here. And if you look at verse 17, <clears throat> first of all, this passage talks about two different kinds of wisdom. You know what they are? It mentions it here in the passage. Two different kinds of wisdom. From two different places. That's right. Godly kind of wisdom from above and earthly wisdom from below. Okay? <laughs> Fleshly wisdom. Um, actually, the, the word says that, that in verse 16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, this is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above, which is it's uh, doing a comparison. And there's a, a word here that says, in verse 17, is first pure, then peaceable, 
gentle and reasonable. And this word reasonable is or willing to yield and not being unreasonable, but being willing to, to yield and to give and submit. Do you know what it is to yield to traffic? No. <laughs> well, at least you're honest. No. <laughs> I remember a bad day several years ago when my nephew Andrew was following me to Lowe's and he had just started working with me a little bit and we were coming off of 501 business where you cross over 501 and you go down on to the thing to merge. Nobody knows how to merge there by the I way. I hate that. Everybody just stops. <laughs> okay. Well, we were merging and I was in my truck and he was behind me in his truck, his Toyota truck at the time. And I kept looking as I'm coming down the ramp to see where an opening was. And I saw an opening. And there was a semi-truck coming. And so I sped up to, to mimic the, the speed of the traffic and I merged in. Well, to my horror, I look in my rear view mirror and Andrew has kicked it and he's trying to keep up with me. And there's a semi right behind me now. And I keep looking and he's trying his best in that Toyota to catch up with me and get in front of the semi. There was no room. And he ran out of pavement, asphalt, went into the grass and cut in front of the semi, hitting the bumper. The semi driver never saw him. He hit the bumper, it turned him this way, crossed over both lanes, into the median and flipped over. I saw it in the mirror. I'll never forget it. And I pulled over as soon as I could. His truck's laying up on its side, and in a minute he popped up, and which that was a relief to see him, you know, intact, scared to death. Um, glass was everywhere. Uh, long story short, uh, he was real upset, and so was I. Um, but the problem was merging into traffic. Um, we have different ideas of what it is to merge, but in the biblical sense, merging means to yield, to submit, to yield to somebody else's authority or their way. They're, they're headed in a certain way. In this case, we're talking about Christ. He has a direction. He knows where he's going. He knows what speed he's headed in, and our lives need to come and, and, and yield to his speed, his direction, and the way he's doing it. And not to try to get ahead of him, not to try to go faster than he is, but to match his speed, his direction, and follow him. You get that? You understand that? And meekness in this passage has a whole lot to do with that yielding and that submission. Meekness is not just, um, it's not just being polite. Uh, meekness is a true uh, estimation of who we are in Christ and a true estimation of his authority in our lives. Okay? Meekness. I'm going to let Francis Chan talk here a little bit about this, and then we're going to revisit a couple passages. Okay? Stop this. So in this passage, James talks about wisdom. And I was thinking about how we don't hear that word that often. I mean, I, I hear people talking about, gosh, that guy's brilliant, that guy's so smart, but when's the last time you just heard of someone who was just wise? Earlier in that chapter, he just said, hey, not many of you should be teachers, but now he's saying, here's the ones that should be teachers. It's, it's the one who's wise and understanding. And he says in, in verse 13, he says, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Like I was saying, we don't hear about this very often, but wisdom was something that they sought after so much. If you remember the story of 1 Kings 3, when God told Solomon, you can have anything on the planet. Like, 
What do you want? It's, it's all, it, he didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask to be brilliant. He goes, you know what? I need wisdom. It was like God gave him the wisdom to ask for wisdom above all other things. And, and God's like, great choice. And I think it's a great time for us to evaluate our lives and go, man, is this what I seek after? And if not, then why not? This isn't about just head knowledge. Uh, he explains that wisdom is really an, an applied knowledge. It has to do with action as much as it has to do with intellect. In fact, he says, uh, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. He's explained that wisdom has to do with your behavior. Once again, here's James again talking about action. He goes, wisdom's about your conduct. It's about what you actually do and to do it in the meekness, the gentleness of wisdom. You see, it's way more than education. He says it's about your conduct. It's about your actual actions. He goes, if you think you're wise, then I should be able to see it by the things that you do and by your general behavior. And he says, also by your meekness. See, we, we live in a time where everyone wants to uh, give advice. They want to tweet. They want to show off their wisdom. But it's interesting. The Bible says the person who truly has wisdom is going to have a meekness about himself or about herself. It's not an arrogance. It's a gentleness. And he says in verse 14, he says, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. So he explains that there's two different types of wisdom. He goes, there is an earthly wisdom, and then there's a wisdom that comes from above. And he says, the way you can tell is he says the earthly wisdom is a person that will be filled with jealousy or selfish ambition. Think about those words, jealousy, selfish ambition. If you find yourself jealous of someone else, wishing you had what they had, or if, if there's selfish ambition involved where you want to make a name for yourself, I mean, I was reading this, I was, I was thinking about even when I first entered into ministry, I remember I used to speak at this camp in the summers, and, and the last day they would have this thing called Victory Circle where all the students would share what they learned during the week, and I, I would try to sneak down there to, to hear what they would have to say because I wanted so badly to hear the students say, oh, it was that speaker, man, he changed my life, or this or that, and, and I look back and go, oh, God, that's so sick. Like, it was about me. Like, I wanted the attention. Rather than the wise person that says, look, I get it. I don't want people to think about me. I, I want to use any wisdom, any knowledge, any gift I have to give glory to him. So people at the end go, man, that God is amazing. God changed my life. But look in your heart. Do you have that selfish ambition? Or do you have a jealousy over those who may have a, have a broader reach than you? Then he continues and he says, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there'll be disorder in every vile practice, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. See, again, wisdom isn't about education here. Wisdom is about action. It's about character. He says, if you have wisdom from above, you know what? Then that person's going to be pure. There's going to be a holiness about your life. He says, then peaceable. You're not quick to start arguments, but you want so badly the peace that God wants amongst his people. He says, gentle, does that characterize you? Open to reason. Are you labeled as unreasonable or are you one that, you know what, you just listen to everything and you evaluate, that's, that's wise, full of mercy. The, the idea is a wise person will, will see needs of others and, and seek to show mercy to them, seek to care for their needs. 
and good fruit. See, again, it, it, it's what comes out of the person's life. Sometimes we, we just want to follow someone because he has a PhD or she has a PhD. And there's a doctor in front of their name. And, and you say, no, it's, it's about look at their lifestyle. Look at the fruit of their life. That's who the teacher should be, impartial. You're wise enough to not show partiality, the favoritism that we talked about earlier in James about how you don't look at the rich as more important than, than those who are starving to death. There, there's not an impartiality with you and there's sincerity. There's a lack of hypocrisy. It's like, look, this is who I really am. Here's my mistakes. Here's the truth about me. And as he describes this type of wisdom, and evaluate your life. But man, can I honestly say that I'm full of wisdom? And is it something you aspire to? Like Proverbs says, seek it more than riches. And remember earlier in chapter one, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God. And say, God, you know what? I realize this is not something I've been pursuing. I've been pursuing success, I've been pursuing riches, I've been pursuing knowledge. But I see in scripture now, wisdom is what you value, and it should be what I value. And to get on your face and say, God, I believe, give me the wisdom I need to navigate through this life in a way that honors you. Is there a difference in wisdom and knowledge? According to what he just said? Yes. yes. We can gain knowledge by gaining information, by, like he said, going to school or listening to conversations, reading books, uh, all kinds of ways. But godly wisdom only comes from one place, and that's from God, and spending time with Him. And it's something that we need to uh, develop and an appetite for. Look back at chapter 1. He, he alluded to this before. But go back to chapter 1 in James, in verse 5. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. That's one of those promises. Verse 6. But let him ask in faith, Without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not this man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man and stable in all his ways. We forget that that's talking about someone who's asking for wisdom, not for material possessions, for health, for relationships, but for wisdom, a godly kind of wisdom and sometimes we forget to connect the dots. We read the Bible like it's separate verses and separate chapters. And we forget that James has a message here. And all these, these verses and chapters, he didn't write it in verses and chapters. It was one message, one letter. And if you look over just a little bit, um, if we get down to um, verse 19. This you know, my beloved brethren, that, uh, but let everyone be quick to hear slow to speak and slow to anger. How do you gain wisdom? Listen, listen carefully to God. He says, pray and ask for wisdom. Listen, listen carefully before you spout out the things that you know or you think you know or you, 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 it just comes out of the flesh. There is earthly wisdom and there is godly wisdom and we have to be discerning of which is which. Um, a couple of things here at the latter part of chapter three, that are the yeah chapter three that we just talked about. He says, verse seventeen. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits. What kind of person is this describing? Have you? Do you know anybody like this? Have you met anybody like this? Has this person ever been in your life? You think of somebody? One person always comes to my mind when I was a kid, and I've told you about him before. All I knew him was his preacher Buck. His last name was Buck. E. Parker Buck was his name. 
I'm surprised I remember that. But when I was a kid, you know when you're a kid, everybody's old. <laughs> and when I was a kid, I thought he was, he was old, and he may have been, I don't know. But the man could turn any conversation toward Christ. I don't care what you're talking about. Fixing your transmission, going fishing, changing clothes, uh, it's raining outside. It didn't matter. The man could turn any conversation to Christ, and he did. He was the most humble, gentle, quiet person you'd ever meet. But he was also the most consistent witness for Christ I had ever met and still have ever met in my life. He always turned the conversation and pointed it to Christ. He was seeking the Lord in everything that he said and did. He was gentle, peaceable, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. It means genuine in, in our walk. Verse 18, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And we've talked before about the difference in peacemakers and peacekeepers. Sometimes we try to be peacekeepers by just saying, oh, well, just let them do whatever they want or it doesn't really matter. And we kind of lower the standards that scripture's already given us. It's not about peacekeeping. Um, it's about making peace when it's a possibility to make peace. And a lot of times that means yielding to someone else or yielding in particular to God as opposed to enforcing my will, my way, uh, my, my, this is what I normally want to do. Uh, there's still a yielding, a meekness in that. Okay, And the best picture, like I shared with you earlier, one of the best pictures that comes to my mind when it talks about wisdom from above and meekness is the merging of traffic and merging into God's way. Jesus says, I am the way. I remember several years ago, uh, a missionary was sending out newsletters to people, letting them know what they were doing uh, on the field. They happened to be in a place that was in a drought and they were teaching people how to, how to drill wells and to make hand pumps and to, to uh, bring the water up so they could have some pure water to drink. And he said, it is my privilege to be in God's way. And he capitalized W-A-Y and he said, I pray that you too will learn to be in the way. And he used the play on words there because Jesus says, I am the way. And that's really what it means. Wisdom from above is finding a way through his word as to how we can align ourselves in righteousness with God and submit to that way. Submit to whatever it is he's doing. And as James here says in, the, in these latter three, three verses here, there's character to that. There's a, there's a peacefulness. There's a patience. There's a meekness. There's a gentleness about the person who is seeking and receiving from God his kind of wisdom. Okay? Any questions or comments about this passage? Wisdom from above. Verse 14 is the opposite of that. But if you have bitterness, jealousy, and selfish ambition in your heart, and, and selfish ambition there, it says strife. It's another way of saying it. In your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. That's, that's the earthly kind of wisdom, the fleshly kind. And it says that's, that's not the godly kind of wisdom. It's not about self. And ironically, uh, we've heard the story of Francis Chan before. Sandy was mentioned today. He was on a television show and how humble he was. If you haven't heard the story or remember when I told you that he had a huge church in California, Francis Chan was senior pastor. He had accomplished the American success story. And it came to his attention that he wasn't as close to God as he used to be and as close to God as he wanted to be. And he came to understanding the only way he was going to get that way is to get rid of some of this other hindrance, the, the hindrances and some of the other responsibilities. He left that mega church, took his family, 
and went away on sabbatical, went away to regroup, to get closer to God, to become um, um, at the foot of the throne again. He felt like he had, he had wandered away from the feet of the Lord. And that takes an understanding of what this passage is saying, is we have to come to him in meekness and an understanding of who he is and how much we need him and really seek after him, diligently seek after him. I love the song that we sing sometimes, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longs after you. That's, that's what this is talking about, is seeking him as uh, a thirsty animal would seek uh, fresh water. Uh, really looking for him diligently in his word. Uh, okay. Um, just remember as we're going through James that um, who he is and the things he said to us previously. Um, and it's just one, one letter. Um, and as Francis Chan mentioned, James talks a lot about daily conduct, action, putting our feet with our, our faith, um, doing things as a result of what we believe, okay? A life that's sitting idly, just treading water is not the life prescribed in Scripture, and it's certainly not the life um, prescribed here and described by James. Uh, this type of life is a faith uh, that's working diligently, okay? And that's really why there's no bleachers in the church building. We're all to be engaged. Um, so let's, let's go back to our, our prayer list tonight. And again, remind you that um, Sunday we'll be uh, giving a love offering to Linda Donald and Linda Tyler. Um, and uh, we'll get a, 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 a date on when we're going to vote on the governing paperwork. And you'll have that acknowledgement uh, at least a week ahead of time in writing. Um, Make sure you get the mass announcements. If you don't, let me know when I add you. I, uh, I had a fellow to text me today and ask me about voting tonight. I said no, and I asked him if he got the mass announcement. He said no, because it was on his home phone. And I said, can I put it on your cell phone? He said, sure. So uh, I'll do that, and it helps. It keeps us up to date. Um, so but I do appreciate the deacon's diligence and looking through and looking over and praying over and asking questions and and wrestling with this. So again, those those page, pieces of paper back there on the next steps counter, they're complete. Um, there's three pieces of paper, and like I mentioned the other day, the policies and procedures are um, guidelines for day-to-day -day operation for the church. The church can exist without them. Uh, there's scripture mandates for just about everything that well, everything that we need. Policies, policies and procedures help us not to be chaotic. Um, our bylaws are more of our legal document and our, our constitution is what we believe, the doctrines that we hold dear and uh, why we do what we do as far as scripture is concerned. That's why we have three. All right. Let's remember these folks we called out tonight and remember them in prayer and, um, and our country and our church and our community. Um, appreciate your continued prayers. Uh, with school and my back and it seems like the two kind of collide and I don't know if it's the, the school stuff makes my back hurt worse or my back hurt and makes school more stressful I don't know which it is but it's wide open today so, <laughs> so pray for me I'd appreciate it greatly um, and uh, as far as I know I'll see you Sunday morning Lord willing so let me pray with you and then I'll let you go Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us and your grace. I thank you, Lord, for your love, your kindness, and I thank you for the discipline and your admonition. It is not pleasurable, but it's needed. And Lord, I thank you for the tribulation and trials that we go through. Um, sometimes we, um, even our inconveniences and being uh, uncomfortable um, gets our attention. And maybe, maybe we need that more, Lord. Um, but I, I thank you that you love us in a way that goes beyond what we ask for. You love us to the point of giving us what we need. Lord, I pray that you be with those that we mentioned tonight in prayer, their families, their caregivers, um, the physical situations. I pray, Lord, that they would receive um, healing in your time and your way. I pray that they would receive grace 
in the meantime and, and also, Lord, spiritually, that this would be a, a fertile soil uh, as far as growth for them spiritually and for, and for me and the rest of us, Lord, that we would learn to depend on you in the midst of, of valleys and, and trials. Lord, I, I pray that you would continue to be with this church and our community as we face our, our national vote and presidential vote as well as other things. And I pray that you would guide us and we would seek your will. Also, Lord, for godly wisdom as we read about tonight and what that looks like. I pray that we would be a church that seeks that godly wisdom um, and that uh, people would be able to describe your church and in these terms as far as meek and patient and kind and people that listen and the things that your your word uh, describes to us father thank you for tonight and i pray that you would keep each one safe as we leave this place in jesus name amen, amen. thank you folks make sure you grab those papers back there on your way out